much for inviting me. It's, 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 uh, it's always nice to be in Dublin, but it's actually interesting to be here now because on the basis, admittedly, of 24 hours, it strikes me that uh, the mood here is, is actually, if anything, rather more optimistic than I imagined and more optimistic than some of the other European capitals I've been to. And recently, I mean, Warsaw, there's a kind of state of suppressed panic about what's going on in, in Russia, France, uh, you know, in the wake of the Charlie Hebdo things, but also a wider sense of national malaise. I think the Germans, even though the economy is not, not as, as weak as others, feel weighed down by the various issues that they're having to deal with. Um, and I think it is, it is a very troubled period in Europe. I was trying to uh, wonder, wonder whether, you know, perhaps I was being a bit hysterical in, in saying to myself that it's more troubled than any period I can remember as a, as a journalist. I've been kind of working now since the mid-80s. Mid but I think that probably is right. And I think the reason is that we're facing three simultaneous crises, each of which on their own would be a major concern. But to have to deal with Russia, with the implosion of the Middle East, and with the Euro crisis simultaneously is a very tall order. And then I think you, you said, is there a fourth crisis? Do the, and I, I think there is, and that, but it's... The, this question of the rise of nationalism, or another way of putting it, is the sort of fracturing of the political centre, is where those previous three crises meet. And that's uh, one of the themes of what I'm going to try and say today, is that although um, in many ways Russia and the Middle East, the Euro crisis, they have very different roots, very different uh, patterns, um, the, the common denominator, it seems to me, is that they're helping to fracture... Uh, politics as we've known it, where for some uh, decades now you've had a kind of mainstream agreement, uh, centrist domination of European politics in the major countries at least, that has then actually been, without us quite realising it, critical to the functioning of the European Union, because when you have these 28 countries meeting, it's very important that you don't have too many, too many Syrizas or, God forbid, national fronts around the table. If that starts to happen then the European Union itself, I think, is under serious threat. But what I'd like to do, and I, th I think you wanted me to talk for about like half an hour and then do a q and is, is to do a little bit on each of the crises and then to try to draw the threads together at the end. Um, you know, take your pick which you find most worrying. Personally, I, I, I find what's, what's happening with Russia the, the thing that's preoccupied me most over the, the last year because... The risks uh, are are probably greatest there of of actually leading to to, to war. Um, it's still a you know an, a strong outside chance. It's not something that's uh, I think highly likely, but it's 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 possible enough to be of a real concern. And it comes down to now, I mean, I think it's a question we've been asking now for more than a year, but it seems to be get, getting more acute rather than less acute, which is what does, what does Putin want, what does Russia want? And then connected to that, how does the West respond as events unfold? Have we got it right? Are we making it worse? And I think that one of the things that makes one anxious about uh, Russia is that so far Putin has shown a consistent ability to surprise on the downside uh, in the sense that... <coughs> If you look back at how we were assessing this crisis over the last 15 months, consistently people who, who should know, kind of experts, were, were saying, oh, well, he won't do that, and then he does it. So that I remember just ahead of the annexation of Crimea, we ran a, uh, an article, or poss possibly it was just a letter in the FT, from a former British ambassador who said, the idea that Putin will annex Crimea is a dark fantasy, and, you know, in a week he, he'd done it. Uh, and then people said, okay, well, Crimea was perhaps a special case, but... Surely he won't now start the incursions into eastern Ukraine. Now that's happened. And then the next question is, well, you know, will he attempt to build this land bridge to, uh, to Crimea by uh, annexing down the coast? I think that's looking quite likely. Um, certainly the, the latest ceasefire has ne never took hold. and It didn't break down. It never, never really started. Um, and then the, then the questions to come are, all this rhetoric about Novorossiya, uh, is, the, is there going to be an effort to try to carve out really a, a significant chunk of Ukraine and turn it into either a, a quasi-independent state under the control of Moscow or, or an exit? 
you can't really write that off. I mean, the, the extent to which that's now a feature of Russian rhetoric is very striking. And then the, the biggest worry, obviously, is the Baltic states. And uh, that is the, because they're in NATO. And that, at that point, the risk of war really does arise if uh, there's Russian aggression against uh, countries that are covered by the Article 5 security guarantee. And again, that's, that really does fall into the surely he wouldn't dot, dot, dot uh, category. Uh, and I, I still think it, it, it unlikely uh, if we kind of keep our nerve. But certainly if you go to Warsaw, to the Baltic states, you get a very different perspective there. I mean, I think they think it's highly, it is quite likely actually, that uh, they have a very dark view of what Russia is up to. And it's a view that it becomes harder to refute. I mean, the last time I was in Warsaw, I had a similar sort of conversation with a now ex-Foreign Secretary uh, Sikorsky, who said, look, a year ago when I said he would go after Crimea, he would go into Ukraine, you all said to me I was crazy, and actually it's happened. So now, you know, listen to, to us when we say the next step is going to be to try to destabilize the Baltic states. And you could see how that could happen in the sense that there are Russian minorities there that can be uh, stoked up in the way that the Russian minorities in, in eastern Ukraine were. And to the, the West then gets into a classic deterrence dilemma. Do we, uh, do we move troops into the Baltic states on a permanent basis as a, a sign of our um, kind of determination not to let that happen? Does that, is that regarded as a provocation in Russia? You're familiar with the arguments, but the... Debate has already moved into territory that, that is kind of startling. I mean, the extent to which the Russians are now prepared to use uh, nuclear weapons as an explicit part of the kind of package of deterrence they're trying to um, push in our faces is, is very uh, interesting. I mean, I, I was at a meeting in Washington a couple of months ago where there were quite a lot of diplomats there and just a few journalists, and there was a, a Russian... Uh, I think it's fair to call him a spokesman. I mean, he was actually a think tanker, but I think he'd been sent there with a message. And he gave a presentation, and there were American diplomats opposite him, about uh, what was going to happen. And the, the sentence that sort of stuck in my head was when he said, um, you have to realize that Putin has put the nuclear gun on the table. And uh, that was obviously you know, a threat and meant to be taken as such. And uh, you, everyone in the room sort of uh, took a step backwards, metaphorically anyway. And then uh, the Americans said, uh, well, I'm very sorry to hear that, Dimitri. And um, that made me laugh because it was actually more or less, I think, a, a direct quote from Dr. Strangelove. Um, <laughs> which, uh, so <laughs> we really are in a stra peculiar territory. Um, but uh, so we were in the sort of, I'm very sorry to hear that, Dimitri, territory. But... This is the kind of language one didn't, uh, you know, didn't expect to hear in, in, in modern Europe. And it gives you a sense of uh, the tensions that, that are out there. Now, it's obviously in Russia's interests to look as scary as possible, and that is why you're getting these overflights and the, this nuclear rhetoric. But um, one can't completely dismiss it because, as I say, Putin has already shown himself to be more erratic uh, certainly in Western terms, than we, we had imagined. Now, the big question, I think, is that's going to... Um, a lot of the debate's going to focus on in the next six months, if, uh, as looks likely, the ceasefire does not take hold and fighting continues, is what does the West do, and do we arm the Ukrainians? And I should say that that comment um, about Putin has put the nuclear gun on the table was explicitly about this question of do you supply arms to the Ukrainians? And... It was a, a threat aimed at uh, persuading us not to do that. And uh, the argument was that if, you do, if Western weapons are being used to kill Russians, uh, that will, uh, I hesitate to use the word, go, make Putin go ballistic in this context, but it will, <laughs> it will anger him. And uh, the, the, the stakes will be upped, and at that point, uh, I think the chap involved said, you know, we, we could well go all the way to Ukraine. Anyway, you'll get a, you, you go to Kiev and, and actually occupy it. Um, the, so the West will have to figure out whether, whether we do this. There's a, a much livelier 
debate about it in Washington, or rather a bigger push, I think, to arm the Ukrainians in Washington than there is in Europe. I think Merkel probably speaks for most of the European governments when she says we're not going to do that. But we're moving into an electoral cycle uh, in the US where the Republicans, certainly I think the kind of McCain wing of the Republican Party will make this an emblem of Obama slash democratic weakness. Obama, rather to my surprise, has started to talk about it at least as a possibility. And uh, it, that will then lead to this question, first of all, how will the Russians react if the Americans actually do it? And secondly, whether we'll, will we be able to keep Western unity, which so far has been reasonably impressive on Ukraine amidst all the strains? If the Americans start arming the Ukrainians, will the Europeans at that point say, look, uh, we're not with you on this? And does that then uh, weaken one of the few things we've got in the West, which has the, been this ability to present a united front? I mean, I think that... The first step will be more sanctions, uh, and there is more we can do. Um, there's this famous SWIFT ban, a uh, ban on the Russian use of uh, electronic money transfers, which sounds pretty technical, but was used against Iran with enormous effect, and the Russians clearly are extremely worried about it. We know this because the Russian ambassador showed up at the FT offices and said they would regard it as a, the equivalent of an act of war if we cut them out of the SWIFT financial system. Uh, so. That was a fairly uh, clear sign that they were concerned about it. But SWIFT is at the, uh, as one American put it to me who's involved in all this, if you think of sanctions on a list of 1 to 10, SWIFT would be 10. And he said, well, so far we're only about 2 or 3. So there's a lot more that can be done. And I suspect that while keeping the, the weaponry issue as a, as a threat, we're probably going to go for more economic sanctions. But even there, within, there's a question about whether in the European Union we can keep that consensus, because they're clearly countries that want the, even the current sanctions lifted. Uh, the Greeks have been most vociferous, but I think that's probably the Italian position as well. And the Italians, you know, a big country, they matter. The French, possibly too. So um, I think that the overall picture is of a worsening of the situation on the ground in U eastern Ukraine and a sense that Western unity on this and a Western sense of that we know how to deal with this and uh, can maintain a united front is going to come under increasing strain over the next year or so. Meanwhile, um, you have the euro crisis going on, which is also obviously f threatening to fracture the European Union. And you, I mean, I thought it was very striking that uh, Merkel had to fly from 48 hours talking to uh, the Russians in Minsk straight to Brussels to then try to deal with uh, Tsipras and Syriza uh, and, and so on. And as a journalist, you know, I suppose it's good times in one sense that you, you, you can take your pick. You've got the, Russia, Greece, the Middle East. There's never something, never a, um, a moment when you don't have a crisis to write about. And, and it's quite interesting trying to work out, well, which one should we be, be most worried about? Uh, because, <laughs> as I say, with Russia... The, the sort of catastrophic scenarios are, are usually the most catastrophic, but, but possibly, uh, you know, they're still at the 10% the chance level, whereas the euro crisis, the chances of the euro actually breaking up, I think, have risen substantially. Now, as you say, we'll find out today whether uh, a deal will be done over Greece. I suspect, it look, I suspect they'll do it and that they will keep the, uh, the show on the road for now. But I, I think that we'd, you'd have to be naive to believe that that's it. I, I think the, the problem is that we've now, uh, those, those who've, of us who've argued that there are big structural flaws in the euro uh, and that these are going to keep coming back to haunt us, uh, um, have, I hesitate to use the word vindicated, but it, it's, that argument's certainly looking a lot stronger uh, year by year. And... A package deal to keep the Greeks in is not going to address those fundamental issues. Now, I'm sure you're, you know, everybody's familiar with the arguments about whether the euro was an optimal currency area and, and whether it's actually structurally damaging the countries of southern Europe. It seems to me that certainly for some of them, for a country like Italy, which has used devaluation and, inf and inflation as kind of key tools for managing their debt, managing their competitiveness, to have those taken away has proved very damaging. I mean, not, it's not the only problem Italy's had. They've got uh, 
uh, you know, the run-up of debt because of the financial crisis. They've got competition from uh, China and so on, which has hollowed out their manufacturing base. The Italians have lost 25% of industrial capacity since the beginning of the crisis. This is hu a huge blow, and those kinds of issues are not going to go away if we get a package deal in Brussels. Um, and they lead to um, the questions of, well, what are the, what are the bigger... Uh, structural solutions one could arrive at. And one of the reasons that I was always um, skeptical of the EU's uh, project for the, for the single currency was a very kind of simple chain of logic, which was to argue that currency unions tend not to survive unless you have a political union, and that I never really believed we would get to a political union within uh, the EU, and therefore I kind of believe that in the long run it won't last. Um, it's a fairly simple chain of logic. But if you put those arguments to people in Brussels, certainly the time I was there, which was 2001, 2005, you tended to get one of two responses. The first was, well, just because most monetary unions, almost all, are backed by a political union doesn't mean you have to have that. And we've set up all these arrangements. And just so you see, it'll work. That was one set of arguments. But actually, it's not working. So I think it's pretty clear you do need structural reforms. The second argument was that, well, if we create the monetary union, the political union will follow, that the, uh, the logic for it will become apparent, and you'll get a transfer union because you'll just need it. And I think that's where the, uh, the, we're, we're reaching a breakdown status, because I think it's become apparent when the Germans were told there won't be a transfer union. Uh, people took that at face value, and they, they're really not up for a transfer union. And the uh, spectacle of what's going on in Greece makes them less and less willing to uh, sign up to the kind of big fiscal transfers that underpin, say, the dollar in the United States. Uh, so we're likely to be stuck uh, with a monetary union that's backed by EU budget that's just 1% of GDP as opposed to a federal budget of which is 19% of GDP in the United States without the transfer union. And uh, with these big competitiveness issues across the monetary union. And that seems to me to be a recipe for continued political unrest and continued discontent. So that even if we manage to get our way past this current crisis, the underlying factors which make the eurozone crisis prone are still there and unlikely to uh, be rectified. So uh, moving right along to the Middle East, um, <laughs> that... Uh, I think also is contributing to this overall sense of crisis within Europe because the whole of the southern border, you know, the, the, the other side of the Mediterranean is obviously in turmoil. Um, and for a while it felt that that could be ignored, or at least the European Union is doing its level best to ignore it. But there are two things that are, are making that a harder position to maintain. One is the growing fear of terrorism and the extent that uh, you get a kind of backwash of people who either directly been radicalized by going to fight in, in Syria or elsewhere, or who've been radicalized by the internet and the kind of propaganda that's coming out of that region. And that is then uh, feeding in directly into fear of terrorism and also social tensions within our own societies about uh, immigration uh, the, and uh, the rise of anti-immigration parties. You, you know the formula. Um, then, of course, there is the flow of migrants, uh, which has become very intense. And I mentioned the problems of Italy economically. Well, Italy is also at the forefront of this. I think there were 100,000 people showed up on the shores of Italy in the first six months of uh, 2014. There are, there, uh, as you know, hundreds of people dying in the Mediterranean. It is a humanitarian disaster, and one which we are very far from coming up with either a coherent European response or really a response of any sort. And it doesn't seem to me likely that that's going to get any better in the short run either because what's happened is the implosion of, of Libya as a functioning state. Libya has now become the transshipment point for people not just from North Africa but all the way back from Eritrea, Niger, countries whose issues we're barely aware of in Europe but which are becoming increasingly uh, things that we're going to have to engage with. And yet, at the same time, I think European countries have never been less willing to put boots on the ground to, to intervene. The faith that we can sort this stuff out by doing that uh, 
is really down to uh, you know, negligible. And we were talking downstairs about Britain's kind of withdrawal from international affairs, and you can cite that in, in various uh, dimensions. There's the, the fact that we're obviously not players in the Euro crisis. The British are not really involved in the Ukraine negotiations, even though they were signatories of the Budapest Memorandum. But for me, it's almost most striking because it was on this watch that the Libyan and Cameron's watch that the Libyan intervention took took place. And there's now almost no discussion in the UK, perhaps because of a sense of embarrassment of what happened in Libya subsequently. No suggestion that uh, that we might have some kind of responsibility for trying to sort it out. Uh, you can you could argue that well maybe we don't, but there's not even a debate. Um, and I think that reflects a profound lack of belief after Afghanistan, after Iraq, and now after Libya, that this is possible. Uh, but that then leads to a kind of sense of helplessness uh, that, you know, would prefer just not to think about it because it's just too difficult. And if Britain, which is, you know, along with France, one of the, the, the two major military powers in the EU, has lost, completely lost its appetite for these kinds of interventions or stability operations at a time when actually, arguably, they've never been needed more, then the chances of, of Europe coming up with a, a coherent solution to this, I think, is, are, are pretty negligible. So the question then becomes, well, what's, what's going to happen in the Middle East itself? And I, I was talking to colleagues who follow the whole question of IS much more closely than I do. And they think that uh, in Iraq itself, actually, the American-led bombing campaign has, if no, uh, nothing else, at least contained the problem. So the idea that uh, they're, not, they're not actually making territorial gains, they may be forced out of Mosul. Syria, we're in this awful paradoxical situation where I think we now, the West is now, having almost bombed Assad in 2012, uh, is, is now in, in, a, in a tacit alliance with him. And... Um, one of the things that's happened is that at the time of the Arab Spring, I think that the, the West sort of briefly, uh, sorry if I, the West is a broad term, but I think in this case it is kind of applicable. There was a sort of joint European-American view that, ah, you know, maybe we found the key to solving our moral strategic dilemmas in the Middle East because we know that the, the false stability of dictatorship is a false stability and also makes us feel bad because we're sort of uh, conniving with all sorts of horrible dictators. And now we can have a democracy and that will kind of sort out the problems of the Middle East and uh, we can even feel better about it. So that's great. Now we've uh, really kind of abandoned that. Uh, there's essentially the Egyptian uh, counter-coup has been endorsed, um, although Sisi is half, far from being pro-American. He's still regarded as certainly better than the alternative. Uh, and watching Sisi at uh, Davos recently, it did strike me, you know, is it conceivable that in five years' time Assad will be speaking at Davos? I don't think it's inconceivable. Um, there's, that, there's that much uh, sort of cynicism taking hold. I mean, I, I think that the debate isn't settled, actually. From what I know of, of the arguments in, in Washington, um, there are people inside the administration who say, look, we've just now got to accept that we are effectively in tacit alliance with Assad and that it is not in our interest for him to go. Maybe we could leave him out and get a sort of another Ba'athist general in charge, but possibly even that's not possible because actually if you take those kinds of regimes, if you take the figure out, figurehead out, they tend to collapse anyway. So that might be too risky. Let's just accept, unpleasant as it is, that's where our interests lie. IS are a threat to us, a direct threat to us. Assad isn't. So let's uh, go with that. But I think that there's still pushback against that view. John Kerry, and the last I heard, was still arguing that actually, no, no, we have to sincerely get Assad out and that the Syrian moderates are, are the way to go. Um, but not many people believe that they're capable of holding the ring. So American policy, even in Syria, is, is confusing and confused, uh, it's, it's, uh, as is European policy insofar as there is one. Um, and then if you look at the broader Middle East, I mean, the US and the West are on, on every side of the argument, so that they're uh, sanctioning Iran, but in a tacit alliance with Iran in Iraq, they're opposed to Iran in Syria. Um, so what are we trying to do? I don't think anybody really knows. Uh, and meanwhile, the, the, the situation continues to deteriorate on the ground. Uh, not everywhere, as I say, the military situation in Iraq is better than it was a few months ago, but, but I think Libya is now the big worry because uh, 
Um, what Al-Qaeda and now IS have always wanted is a real nice failed state where they can operate freely. And Afghanistan was quite a long way away, but Libya is right on the shores of the Mediterranean and looks very much like it's meeting that, uh, that bill. So um, that's crisis three. Uh, and as I said, I think that the, the danger for Europe is that those crises are merging in the sense that they're helping to destabilize mainstream politics within the European Union. Now, how, how is that happening? Well, you, you have various uh, revolts. You have the revolt against austerity going on, and that's um, uh, connected to the Euro crisis, obviously, and that's epitomized by Syriza in Greece, but it's also Podemos in Spain uh, and, and a host of other left and right-wing parties, which have been making gains, and Syriza was the first one to actually take power at a national level. And as we're all aware, one of the reasons that uh, governments from Ireland to Spain to Italy are not willing to give them any ground is precisely because they fear encouraging the Syriza-like parties in their own countries. Uh, how that plays out, we'll see over the next year, but it, there clearly has been... Uh, perhaps a slightly delayed reaction to the financial crisis of 2008, the economic fallout, but it's now happening and you are getting uh, left-wing, anti-capitalist, in broad terms, parties uh, coming forward. Um, you then have the revolt against immigration, uh, which is fueling the, the far right, and just jotting down the parties who would fall into that category, where you have the National Front in France, you have UKIP in the UK, at the kind of fascistic end of things, you have Golden Dawn in Greece, the Sweden Democrats, who I'm told are pretty nasty characters, who are up to about 10% in Sweden, the Danish People's Party, you have a similar party in Norway, which is actually in government. So it's and the, the Northern League in Italy. If anything, that's more ubiquitous than, than the anti-austerity parties. And one of the things that actually unites the far right and the far left is the surprising extent to which they're pro-Russia. Uh, or pro-Putin, uh, so that if you looked at the people who sent along uh, so-called observers to the kind of slightly phony referendum in Crimea, they included Die Linke from Germany, but also the Front National in France. Um, so the far left and the far right seem to share some kind of uh, soft spot for, for Putin. Um, and it's not just De Linke in Germany. Uh, the Mélenchon in, in, in France is also fairly pro-Putin. Uh, and there are others. And I think for the left, maybe it's just a residual uh, kind of sympathy for Russia. Syriz is obviously the other example. Um, possibly it's to do with a sense that anything the EU is opposed to, they're in favor of. Um, and I think that certainly is the case for the far right that if you look at the rhetoric of, uh, rhetoric's too strong a word, they were kind of throwaway comments by Nigel Farage, but quite telling comments. I mean, his initial reaction to the Ukraine crisis, because he sees everything through the prism of the EU and his dislike of the EU, was to say, well, this is all the EU's fault, and therefore to slightly revel in the extent to which Putin was pushing back against the EU. And that's certainly very much part of the Marine Le Pen reaction to it. Uh, she's become pretty close to Putin indeed. I think he's, I uh, don't know whether it's actually confirmed that the Russians are funding the, the National Front or just one of those things that's out there, but there clearly is a, a close relationship. Um, so for the, for the right, it's, it's, it's Putin's hostility to the EU. It's a taste for nationalism as opposed to supranationalism. It's also social conservatism. The whole kind of anti-gay bit plays into the, the social conservatism of, of uh, the far right. And um, there, are, there are some parties which have managed to con com combine all three of those uh, kind of themes that are appealing to the extremes, the anti-austerity, the revolt against immigration, and the pro-Russian bit of the National Front in France are the, uh, are the main example of a party that's actually managed to assimilate all three of those themes. And... Um, the question is, how, well, how threatening is this? Uh, you know, are these parties kind of signs of distress, economic and political distress in Europe, but, but they're manageable, they're not going to uh, really do much damage, they'll stay at the 20% or so level and, and then gradually subside? Or are they a threat to... Uh, could some of them take power? 
and uh, or, or if they even if they don't take power, could they so affect the way that the political discourse is carried out that they make the EU harder to operate? I mean, you can see an element of that in the UK. We were talking downstairs about well, what does Cameron want? What, is, what does he want with the European Union? I mean, I think it's very domestically politically driven. It's driven by the rise of UKIP and splits within his own party. And really, he just needs something that's going to make that go away. And that then makes him behave in a way that his European partners find very difficult. And so you don't necessarily need these parties to take power for them to start driving the political agenda. Another example would be uh, the hardening of, say, Sarkozy's rhetoric on immigration, which is clearly a response to uh, the kind of attempt to take away some of the ground from the National Front. Uh, so they're, they're changing the discourse already. But I think it, it becomes potentially critical when uh, a far-right or far-left party actually gets hold of power in a European Union government. And when I've sort of tried to think, out, think through in my own mind, well, you know, if the euro collapses or, God forbid, the European Union itself collapses, how would it, what would the mechanism be? What would be the trigger event if that happened? And it's always seemed to me that the real danger is if you get the collapse of the consensus among the 28 governments that's tended to get us through crises. Because however bad it's been, if you've had a European Council where essentially there are 28 countries or the most important ones committed to somehow sorting it out because they believe in the European project, you've tended to get to the other side of it. But if you have a European Council where there are parties that really don't accept the idea of the European Union or really have ideas that are so radical that the others can't accept them, then you're in trouble. <coughs> and we've got a first taste of that trouble with Syriza, which is why, as we were saying, it's been such an important test case and why people are so unprepared to give it ground. And I think that with Syriza, essentially, I mean, you know, I'm tempting fate. We'll find out tonight. But my guess is that they will essentially be forced to back down. And in that sense, there'll be a sort of sigh of relief. And, well, you know, these radical guys, they didn't get anywhere, and that's all fine. But the question is, what... The thing is, Syriza are too isolated and, and operating from too weak a starting position, both as a small country and a country on the point of bankruptcy. They have no leverage. So they're pretty easy to shove back into their box. Again, tempting fate. Maybe that won't happen. But what if, what if there were several Syrizas around the table? Or what if it was a country that was actually a large country, you know, a national front government, God forbid, in France? Then I think at that point the EU actually does become inoperable. Um, and that's why I think all these three crises and the way they're merging together are a threat to us. I mean, I was able to... I talked at the beginning about the really kind of uh, blood-curdling threats, you know, war with Russia, massive terrorism, that kind of thing. Uh, but I think that the, the most plausible threat, certainly from the situation we're at now, is just an erosion of our institutions, a radicalization of politics to the extent to which the European Union itself, which has, for all its uh, flaws, been the kind of framework in which uh, politics has operated in Europe for the last 40 years and more, and has been terribly important for bringing Europe together after the end of the Cold War. If that begins to uh, erode and break down, then I think we're in a, a new situation domestically and, inter and internationally, and one which is not, uh, not particularly favorable. So I'll stop there, but I'd be happy to, to take questions, particularly ones that tell me that I'm wrong and uh, <laughs> it's all going to be fine.